Well, great. Um, again, I'm Dr. Laurie Herman Ginsberg, and I would like to welcome you to the University of Kansas School of Education and Human Sciences Annual Summer Conference for Educators. Um, this is the Strategies for Educational Improvement 2021. Um, we are very pleased to be able to offer this conference again virtually this year, and we are happy that we are able to offer this free access to educators across the region. Um, we also wanted to um, let you know that this conference is also sponsored by the Kansas State Department of Education and the Kansas Alliance for the Arts and Education. The conference is hosted by the Global Education Academy, which is a unit of the School of Education and Human Sciences. The Global Education Academy works with leading theorists, innovators, and practitioners around the world to offer educators online professional development with options for earning micro learning credentials that are also stackable toward graduate credit. So for more information about this, it is available at global-academy at ku.edu. And I believe there's a screen where you can see that information. Our theme for this year's conference is Back to the Future, Time to Redesign. We, as we prepare to re-enter our buildings with our students in the fall, hooray, hooray, um, what should we be thinking about? What have we learned during the past year that might help us create a new normal that offers even better experiences for our students and teachers? Our focus in today's session is the well being of students. Um, we have invited three outstanding experts to share different perspectives on ways of supporting the socio emotional health of our students. Um, we will be taking questions um, during the uh, at the end of all three presentations. I would encourage you, though, that as you have questions or as questions occur to you as the presenters are doing your presentation, please go on and enter them in the question and answer the Q and A um, section. Don't use the chat. Uh, function, make sure you use the Q&A function. And again, enter those as the questions come to your mind. And then we will be going back to those after all three presenters have um, had a chance to present their information and um, hopefully have a great vigorous conversation. Um, we have three speakers with us today. Um, we have um, Dr. Shanna Bigler, uh, Dr. Amy Gomer Erickson, and Mrs. Marta Silva. So we are going to start um, with um, Dr. Shanna Bigler. So let me introduce her to you. Um, Shanna is the mental health education program consultant with the Kansas State Department of Education. Shanna's work focuses on school mental health and supporting Kansas school systems in supporting students with their social emotional wellness. Specific support areas typically include discipline, suicide prevention, bullying prevention, school climate, school staff wellness, working with school social workers, and measuring socio-emotional growth. Prior to working at KSDE, Shanna served as a school principal in Seaman USD 345 and Topeka Public Schools USD 501. Shanna's areas of concentration have included mental health in schools, working with families in poverty, educate, early education, special education services, school community partnerships, and family engagement. Shanna has 18 years of experience in education as both a teacher and a school administrator. So I would like to um, welcome Shanna, and we are really excited about learning from her expertise. So Shanna, thank you so much for being with us. Sure, thank you, Lori, and um, thank you for the advancement of my title. I am the ABD, so I have all but my dissertation done for my doctoral program. Um, getting closer though, I'm excited to be with everybody today. This is definitely one of my favorite topics um, of all times. And you might kind of think that my presentation is a little bit of a far stretch, but bear with me and keep an open mind. Um, I really like analogies and neuroscience. And so putting those two things together is really 
fun. So I am actually going to share my screen. I'm on a dual screen. So if I look like I'm looking away from you all, I do apologize for that. Um, they have like three screens for us here and it gets very complicated. So this past year, everyone survived. If you are on here, that means you survived and that is fantastic. Um, what we're hoping for for next year is that we move from that status of surviving to thriving. That's our goal. So the title of today's presentation for me is From Surviving to Thriving. You can see why. So we're going to talk today um, for my session a little bit about trauma responses and how that is coming out um, from children, the physiological response to trauma, and then we'll end with some um, practical things to, that teachers can do in classrooms for building resiliency and positive childhood experiences. So we will start with our objectives. The first is to understand the relationship between trauma and the COVID pandemic through a neuroscience and brain emotional systems theory. Number two, to understand the physiological response to trauma and how it may present in the classroom setting. Then to understand a new job description of building resilience through positive experiences using purpose and belonging, safety and conflict resolution. And the last one is that teachers will have a set of practical, simple, logical tools to implement immediately in August. So like I said before, the theme of last year was I will survive. We're gonna move into a theme this year of I will thrive. So I just thought I would share with you. All right. So as we get here, I wanna talk a little bit about trauma. Um, for something to be considered traumatic, it has to meet the definition of three E's. So it has to have an event, an experience, an effect. So if we look at COVID and the pandemic as a trauma, we know that it meets the criteria of an event. Um, it definitely took place. We all had to, had to go through it. Um, however, that experience was different for everyone. For some children, they had family members or themselves that got sick or perhaps even died. Um, they may have had family members lose jobs. They may have not had any changes at all in their life. They may live you know, in a very small town where it wasn't really impacted as much. So then that would be the effect. And so everyone takes in trauma in a different way based on their experience of it. And then the effect of that will determine what the result is ongoing for them and how much it impacts their life. Effective neuroscience, one of my favorite topics. So Yak Ponsep um, actually began this work uh, in the 90s, he, he did some studies then. So in 1998, he did a study with pup rats and cat hair. And I don't know if anyone has seen this study. It's typically um, gone through in social work courses quite carefully, but um, not always in, in education. But um, Ponksep used rat pups um, to do his experiment with. And these, rats were raised in a lab and he started off with just having the rats in a cage and pup rats actually have a lot of interaction with each other and play a lot so you can tell on this graph here that they had a lot of play four days later he then introduced a single cat hair into the cage um, the pup rats obviously had been raised in in a lab setting, had never been around a cat, had no experiences with a cat. However, that single cat hair was placed in a cage. And you can see that immediately their interactions dropped to almost nothing. That cat hair was then removed and the pup rats started playing some more, just slowly, but it never got quite up to the level it had been before. Now, what they did that you don't see on this graph later was they discovered that pup rats can actually laugh. And so when they're tickled, they start laughing and they became more interactive and their brain functioning started going faster and better. And so they started tickling the pup rats and actually got better amounts of play. So you might wonder how that has anything to do with COVID but here's my analogy. So if you think of the rats as our society, 
then their play was their, our social wellness, the functioning level that society was at. Then if you think of the single cat hair as COVID, it got introduced to our society at one time. That was the trauma. That's the trauma that came in. Then we had the introduction of the cat hair into the cage. So the, the COVID hit the United States and immediately what happened is we went in to shut down and quarantine. And that impact was a function of survival and fear isolation. When the vaccine came out, that would represent the removal of the cat hair and that security and safety. Then finally, the tickling that represents connection, touch and relationships, which is what we know builds resilience. Another way of looking at this is through the emotional systems theory. Again, Yak Pongsep um, did this emotional systems theory and I found it to be a, another really good analogy of how um, our society handled the trauma of COVID. And again, remember that trauma, depending on experience and effect, could have been different for everyone, it is different for everyone. So this emotional systems theory, you can see starts at the bottom with this seeking function. In this emotional state, people are monitoring their environment. They're addressing their basic needs. So an example of this during the pandemic would have been the hoarding of the toilet paper shortage, the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. Um, then as we moved up into the next phase of emotional status, we hit this panic. So people became the emotion tied to this with sadness, loneliness, anxiety, and fear. That presented itself as avoiding danger, so the isolation and the quarantine. After that was this phase of assertiveness. So this was rage, anger, compete, defend. This really was exemplified by the racial um, unrest that we had in America, the attack in January on the White House, um, the election upheaval, all of that kind of civil unrest came out at that point. Then we moved into this feels good. This is when the vaccine came out. So this feels good, like things are getting better. There's gonna be security, there's gonna be safety. Um, things are gonna get back to normal. From there, we move into this phase of connection. And this is really kind of what everybody has been doing this spring, their collective purpose, belonging and comfort. So people have been volunteering, there's been benefit concerts, um, public service announcements, like we can do this together, part themes. Um, and then from there, we go into this final stage of play mode where there's social joy and bonding. And that's where, where we're hitting with the new social norms and getting back to normal. So I like both of those analogies for kind of how COVID presented a trauma impact in our society. So any trauma, um, COVID other, or otherwise, for children is going to have a physiological um, impact on them. So what that looks like is you go into, when you have trauma, you go automatically into the fight or flight kind of mode um, in the brainstem. And a lot of this work, you know, a lot of these neuroscience pieces on this stuff can really come from Bruce Perry as well. Um, but if you are so long in this prolonged brainstem mode of life, your adrenaline and cortisol regions of the brain that control mood, motivation, and fear are drastically impacted. So when the adrenaline and cortisol gets pumped in, you have an increase of heart rate, blood pressure, increased energy, increase of glucose, decrease of immune system, um, digestive system issues, reproductive problems, and decreased growth, growth process. Then how that's seen is increased anxiety, kids get sick faster and more frequently. They may have sleep problems. They may present some signs of depression or have memory and concentration issues. And so it's really going to be important as we go back in the fall to talk to kids about things like their sleep habits, to teach them self-regulation and coping strategies, to monitor them for signs of physical distress, um, check in for depressive measures and provide them brain breaks and minimize the pressure that they're under. So again, in the classroom setting, 
trauma may look like any of these things, difficulty learning, depression, suicide, lack of attention, anxiety, illness, physical changes, lack of ability to sit still or focus that's not normal um, for that child. Those could all be signs of, of trauma. And trauma can so easily be mistaken for other things. And so it's really important to, to be able to recognize the signs when you see them. So how we can help kids is by teaching them how to recognize their own signs of stress, because only by recognizing their signs of stress will they be able to then do something about it. So increased heart rate, it's very easy to help children learn how to take their pulse and understand that if their heart rate's over 100, they can breathe to slow it down, things like that. If they're flushed and hot, they can start recognizing that. They can be prompted through um, stomach pains, tummy aches all the time, things like that, uh, sleep issues for them to recognize that they've been going to bed and sleeping through the night or if they're getting up multiple times a night, for them to be able to articulate that will help them. Um, sweating, rapid breathing, all of those things um, are physical signs of stress that kids can become aware of and cognizant of. So then what do you do about those? Relationships. So human relationships are the most effective antidepressant. Um, I love that, I really believe that. It, that connection piece is so important. And for meaningful connection, you know, Dr. Buck Bailey says it best when she says you have to have eye contact, presence, touch and a playful um, attitude and demeanor that will solve just about everything over time. So building resiliency. So these are the strategies for implementation in your classroom. We know with trauma and with stress that, I am sorry, my phone is ringing that purpose and belonging are key. Um, in order to be resilient, you have to have a purpose. So if that purpose for a child is a classroom job or being a peer tutor to someone else, find a purpose. If you have a kiddo that's in your classroom and they seem stressed or they seem like they have maybe had some trauma impact, giving them a purpose to be there every day and to be a functioning, contributing member of that classroom setting is vital. Um, belonging. This is the other piece that is so important. Bruce Perry refers to it as flocking, um, which would be social referencing and kind of looking around, seeking approval from those around you. When you think about flocking and belonging, everyone wants to belong to something greater and bigger than they are. That's why we have things like sports teams and associations, branches of the military, um, gangs, even Facebook groups, you see commercials all the time now for certain Facebook groups that people can identify with because they want to belong to something that has significant purpose for, for moving on in life. Um, conflict resolution. There's lots of information online that you can find. I'm not going to get into all of these today because it's a lot, um, but on restorative justice practices on circles, restorative justice circles and talking through conflict, relationship repair when there's been damage done in a relationship. Those are, are incredibly important pieces, um, especially when we're looking at, like I said before, the racial tension and the inequities and the LGBTQ plus and, you know, stuff coming out with kids. Safety is probably the number one um, piece I want to talk about. And safety is in all of these areas, mentally, emotionally, socially, environmentally, and physically. Our kids have to feel safe in every single one of these areas. So mentally safe. For kids to be mentally safe at school, teachers are going to have to understand that they have a new job description. And that job description is not just to teach. It is to make sure that every child in that classroom is emotionally and mentally ready to learn. Because if they're not, they won't learn. And so check-ins might be the new kind of bell work. I would recommend if anyone's interested looking at Panorama Education, they have a question bank um, of question student check-ins. It's like 80 questions that checks on student wellness. A couple examples might be, what emotion are you feeling the most today? During the past week, how often did you feel loved? Or during the past week, how often did you feel safe? Those kinds of questions that will really give you insight onto if you need to talk with that child further, build a further connection with them to help them get through something. 
um, so that they can focus on school. Another piece, another strategy is this important person identification. Um, this is where you ask every student uh, who in the school, what adult, what person in the school loves them, cares about them, they can talk to, that they feel comfortable with. And oftentimes it's just helpful to have them write it down on an index card to keep that in the file. So if something comes up and you need to help them through, you can go get that important person to them that they have identified. And then you also can see those kids that don't have somebody who don't feel like they have someone to go to and that then can be created for them. Another important aspect of mental safety is teaching that failure is a step in the process of learning. It's okay to fail, that's how we learn. And taking risks and learning is okay as well. Emotionally, students can develop self-care plans. Um, there's lots of examples on the internet of self-care plans, but it's basically how they're going to be mindful of taking care of themselves mentally, physically, and all of the ways. Daily affirmation echo activities. Many teachers have done this for years and it's incredibly effective. You know, ending your day with the kids echoing from you, I am loved, I am smart, I am capable. Them saying those things out loud they hear it then. If you say it, you hear it. And the more you hear it, the more you believe it. Teaching calming strategies like yoga, mindfulness, and breathing exercises, that's also very helpful tools. Um, the Kansas Tazin webpage has some really good examples of those things and training on that. And then at KSDE, also on our webpage, we have a suicide toolkit. So if that needs to be accessed, it is there. Physically. Kids need to move. They've been going through COVID. They've either been allowed to move constantly or maybe they haven't moved at all. But regardless, they need opportunities for movement in the classroom. So I encourage everyone to think about, you know, what are your expectations? Do you expect them to sit at a desk all day? Does, do you care if they stand up? What does it impact and lessen if they sit crisscross on the floor versus at their desk? So just kind of think about your own teaching practices and what you allow um, with movement. Availability of snacks and food. You know, food insecurity may have been an issue for some students over the past year. And maybe they'd be able to focus a lot more if they knew that they had available snacks at different points in the day. Um, giving them frequent breaks. Their minds just are going to need a break. Everything is going to be new content again coming in. Um, and so just knowing that it takes time to process and it's okay to go slow and let them take breaks to process things. Um, Dr. Perry talks about when kids zone out that that really may be a, a time that they're not daydreaming, but that they're processing the information that they've learned and heard. Um, having available cleaning supplies, uh, hand sanitizer, soap, masks, those things that physically they have represented safety and security for the kids through the pandemic. Social safety, digital citizenship is huge. The online impact of bullying um, can be devastating. So having a pulse on what apps are your students using? Are they using Instagram? Are they using Facebook? What are they saying about those things? Because that can be very damaging. It can just compile trauma onto children. So being aware of that so that you can help have honest and open conversations and help kind of shut those things down as they come up is really important as well. Uh, again, KSDE has a bullying toolkit available and it's on our website as well. A daily joke, and again, this is another practice that isn't new, but is so important. So again, we go back to that pup rats and, and them laughing really added to their brain activity and connection. It's the same thing with people. Um, you might consider having a daily joke to get the kids laughing or to have the kids each have a daily joke for each other, something like that, um, so that there's, there's that connection and laughter and fun together. Um, incorporating activities that involve touch, human touch of some kind, um, a school family commitment that the perspective, Dr. Becky Bailey uses this phrase, the school family, and that's, it's really that perspective of belonging of this is my school family, this classroom now is we take care of each other, we're here for each other, um, we're in this together. A we Care Board, again, that's a Dr. Becky Bailey, um, and so is the rituals. And it's basically a We Care Board is when you recognize that something may be going on with a student. And so you just basically post up, we care about you, you know, hope you're doing well. Uh, the rituals would be like, 
you know, a special classroom handshake coming into the classroom or a fist bump or a foot bump or whatever you want to do. Um, but certain rituals that happen throughout your school day, throughout your school year, that just your class does together to help build that connection and belonging for them. And I'm gonna to try to go fast because I'm out of time. Um, environmental safety. So quiet, safe space to be alone in the classroom. That's just standard. That's good for every classroom to have across the board. Um, consistent, predictable routine and schedule and opportunities for open dialogue for the kids to just talk. Okay, so I kind of went through things at the end pretty quickly. My references are on here if you want to take a look at those. Yep, they're in my timer. And here is my contact information. So feel free to give me a call at any time. Um, it's kind of weird to present to people that I, I can't see, but I hope um, that you all learned something and I wish you well today. Shanna, thank you so much for your presentation and all of the ideas that you had. I know that um, even though I'm teaching at the college level, there were many of those things that were great takeaways for me and things that um, I think I need to remember in my classroom coming up this fall as well. Um, so if you have questions, again, everyone, please go on and you can start posting those questions. We will come back to all the questions after each of the presenters has presented, um, but just don't, I don't want you to forget your questions, so feel free to go on and put them in the Q&A section now. So I want to uh, now introduce our second speaker. Um, this is Dr. Amy Gomer Erickson. Um, she is an associate research professor at the University of Kansas Center for Research on Learning. She focuses on comprehensive implementation and evaluation of educational initiatives that improve in-school and post-school outcomes for students. Her work centers on the implementation of instructional practices with multi-tier system supports that enable students with and without disabilities to become college and career ready. Through her collaboration with state departments of education, Dr. Gomer Erickson designs high quality professional development and implements evaluation plans that track the fidelity of implementation as well as the short-term, immediate and long-term outcomes for students. To support continuous educational improvement, she has developed evaluation instruments that provide a school-wide perspective on educators' implementation strategies. Um, she's also published books and articles that provide practical assessments, educational strategies, and supports to the cognitive, intrapersonal, and interpersonal growth of students. So Dr. Gama Erickson, thank you so much, and we welcome you and are excited about your pres presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor to be with you today, and I just set my 20 minute timer. <laughs> Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the college and career competency framework, about teaching uh, students intra and interpersonal skills. And so uh, I am so glad that I had the chance to listen to Shanna um, because this goes to that next step. So all of the things she said, absolutely vital. And now we also need to teach students the skills to make them more independent in being able to um, manage stress, uh, achieve their goals as they move forward and have strong interpersonal skills while doing so. And so one of the things that Shannon mentioned was a self-care plan. I'm going to refer to that a little bit today as a self-regulation plan related to whatever it is you want to achieve, including self-care. Um, so this wheel, we call it the College and Career Competency Wheel. Um, my colleague Patty Noonan and I have been working in this realm for more than a decade. Um, and uh, I have a lot of background teaching at the middle and high school levels. Uh, what we found through uh, a huge number of literature reviews is that there are demonstrable skills that are teachable that can support students uh, within school and within careers, uh, social endeavors, uh, whatever it is that they are working on uh, to be more successful. And so what you see on the wheel are three domains, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and cognitive. And then within those, there's some kind of highlighted words. 
Uh, these are the competencies or skills that have been found to be foundational. Um, kind of that, where do you start? Self-regulation, self-efficacy, assertiveness, conflict management. And when I say assertiveness, it's a little different than the research that Shanna used. Uh, it really means expressing your wants, needs, and thoughts while respecting others. And so, yes, many of the behaviors we saw during the pandemic were assertive, but I would argue that many of them were also aggressive, uh, which is beyond what we want to see. It, it no longer has that respect value. And uh, so, as I said, these are research-based. They're shown to improve in-school and post-school outcomes. And I think what is most important is that they are teachable and generalizable. We can use them in all aspects of our life. So going a little bit deeper, that, that is still too much. Thinking about those six competencies, what we really need is to focus on one or two competencies, teach them really, really well with lots of practice, um, lots of opportunities for students to demonstrate the competencies with tons of feedback. Um, we need to teach social emotional learning at that same depth as academics, but to do so, we need to tie it to what is part of the students' lives, which is the academic content. So it's not something that needs to be taught in isolation. Um, so many educators across Kansas have been asking students, what do you need to learn? What do you do well? Um, what do you need support in? And so these are the results from over 11,000 Kansas students. And they say over and over again, they need support in kind of that uh, self-regulation, self-management area, um, being able to um, manage their emotional reactions, uh, get their homework done, plan uh, their self-care, all of those things. And then that kind of middle um, orangish, greenish area, um, conflict management and assertiveness really hit that interpersonal domain. They need the skills in order to be able to speak up, to express themselves, to ask for help when they need it, to have interactions with others where uh, it is effective and productive uh, rather than being confrontational or avoidance both things we want to avoid in conflict management, right? We actually want cooperation, collaboration, compromise, all of those good words. And so this is an assessment that is free. You're welcome to use it. Um, I'll give a few more resources at the end, but you can find all of these resources at cccframework.org, which is available um, in each of the PowerPoint slides. So how do we actually go about providing instruction? We do it the same way we do other things, multi-tiered system of support. There is a universal base level of instruction that all students need around um, intra and interpersonal skills. It should not be hidden this. It should not be based on whatever teacher you have. Uh, it really should be systematic throughout the school. And uh, KSDE has social emotional character development standards that help guide some of that learning. Um, we need to be using data for our decisions, um, both at the individual student, class-wide, school-wide levels, and we've got to collaborate about it. Um, this is not something that we pigeonhole into a single class. It is a uh, skill building, knowledge building, environment changing aspect that we need across our entire school environment. So as I said, we have lots of resources that can support you in this, but what I really want to get to today is a couple strategies that you can take away right now and do. So we're going to practice some strategies. Um, all of these resources are available on our website. Uh, most of them are free. Uh, you are welcome to take and use them in any way that supports you. We also have lessons designed for the middle and high school levels. Um, they have been adapted down to kindergarten, um, but uh, they are primarily designed for adolescents um, in self-regulation, conflict management, assertiveness, and self-efficacy. And so these lessons kind of provide that base level of knowledge. Um, if you have a mentoring or an advisory course and you want um, to be able to pull in instructional practices uh, without redesigning it for yourself. 
Um, so uh, it is just a way to get ideas, to be able to uh, use activities that will make a difference in building students' knowledge and skills around these competencies. Um, I have another book coming out in the fall of 75 instructional activities uh, for teaching adolescents self-regulation, building their resilience. So we're going to talk about self-regulation. It comes out as one of the highest need competencies. It relates directly to what Shanna was just talking about. So I want you to ponder just for a moment. Self-regulation has four components plan, monitor, adjust, and reflect. In order to effectively self-regulate, we must do all four of those components. Which of those do you think students rate as the hardest, the least likely for them to do? Everybody got your guess? The correct answer is plan. Students don't know how to effectively plan. What do I do when I'm feeling anxious? What is the plan for that? Um, what do I do when I don't understand the homework? Uh, how do I get all of my work done and manage my time effectively? So we're gonna go through a couple strategies together. I want you to each look at this slide and use the annotate feature. So up by my name, and I think this will work, uh, you should see view options and next to that an annotate and stamp. Pick any stamp there, and I want you to mark on the screen any of these things that you have worked on in the past year, any that have been a goal for you um, anytime, and we could go two years if you would like, um, but definitely think about your past year. Uh, which of these things have you focused on? And if you're not able to annotate, it doesn't matter. I just need you thinking about one. Okay, everybody got one of those in your head? Save money, manage stress, eat healthier, complete tasks. Okay, so here is the real activity. This is a research-based strategy actually from Goldwitzer. Um, Carol or um, Duckworth uh, has talked a lot about um, this strategy. Angela Duckworth has done lots of research on it, um, but we're gonna try it together here. You ready? It's called mental contrasting. Of those goals, think about one of those for yourself. Think about your goal. Think about all the good things that will come from achieving your goal. Keep thinking all those good things. Now think about the barriers. What could go wrong along the way? Now I want you to imagine yourself overcoming those barriers. That's it. That is mental contrasting. That is the simplicity of a research-based strategy. Um, a few resources that you might read, I put into the chat, as well as just this outline from this page and another strategy I'm gonna talk about. But I wanna talk just a little bit about that research. Um, participants who did this strategy uh, in a physical exercise group, uh, they actually exercised twice as much as the control group. The only difference between the two groups, one group used this strategy. Um, when focused on healthy eating, the group that did mental contrasting showed a 30% improvement in diet. Uh, other researchers, Ottinger in 2010, found that uh, students were more likely to seek academic help when they needed it using this strategy. Uh, it's been applied to smoking cessation, uh, self-management of diabetes, any of those um, goals that you have, this strategy can help with. Now let's go a step further. The next strategy I wanna talk about is called if then or implementation intentions. So the simple way to think about it is if this happens, 
then I will do this. Everybody got that in their head? Think about the goal you just were talking about. Take one of those barriers or challenges. If this happens, what is your then? Make it specific and come up with a then. Now let's apply it related to things that your students might come up with. So I'd like you to go to this Padlet. Um, I put the link in the chat, but you can also use this QR code uh, from your phone and go to this link. What you are going to do is you are going to be approached with a few statements. And what I'd like you to do is finish them with the then part of the strategy. If I don't understand the assignment, then what are some thens that your students might come up with or thens that you might come up with as you are probably working on graduate work um, or other things that are vital within your work? And while you're working on that, I want to give just a little bit more of the research around uh, implementation intentions, if thens. Um, when combined um, researchers have found that uh, students' grades improved, their attendance improved, their conduct improved, uh, there was a large meta-analysis and the effect size of this strategy alone was 0.65 for goal striving. So if you've read any of John Hattie's research, you know anything above 0.4 is really good and what we want to see. And this is at a 0.65 for effect sizes. Keep going on adding some of those if thens. You don't have to go in order. Uh, you can jump all over the place if you would like. And I'm going to give you 30 quiet seconds to actually finish your thought. These are absolutely fantastic. And one of the things I wanna really emphasize here is you made these for yourself. Students as young as preschool can determine their own bends. They can come up with what will work for them or what they want to try. Um, so if you're fe feeling anxious, go for a walk, step back and come to, back to it. Take a deep breath and start again. Um, use one of the common strat calming strategies that you have been taught. Uh, all of these things are phenomenal and we are going to adjust them along the way, right? So if one strategy doesn't work, then we might add the next then or try a different one the next time. Uh, if you don't understand something, uh, when I ask students this, uh, sometimes they have to pause for a minute. The answer isn't immediately, I will ask the teacher. A few students say that. A lot of students say, I'll try to figure it out. I'll check out a YouTube video. I'll ask a friend. All of these are uh, completely okay. And we need to support them within our classroom. Um, and then all of these, you can read them by going to the link and uh, being able to see what everyone else came up with. But I love that if I'm feeling tired, we all have moments and we are at that mid-afternoon crash for me. Uh, so all of these are great. Uh, if you would like to, you're not on video, you can get up and stretch right now. Uh, you can move around the room a little bit. I appreciate you participating in those activities with me. Those are two very short research-based activities that are included uh, within our lessons with a lot more information. But in 20 minutes, I really wanted you to walk away with something that you could go and do as soon as tomorrow if you're teaching summer school or with your students, with yourself, with your children. Um, 
maybe with your dog. If your dog is doing this, what is your reaction? Uh, mine's asleep on the floor right behind me. So. so then what does the process really look like? Not only do we have to create that environment, all those things that Shannon talked about, we have to teach students. We can't expect that they already know these behaviors. As I said, I teach at the middle and high school level. There are still explicit skills that students can learn around self-regulation, around being assertive. And then we have to determine our impact and continually improve. Data should be used like for this just like it is for reading and math. We need to know that students are learning it and practicing it um, and that they're able to demonstrate these skills independently. And if not, that just means they need more instruction, more practice, maybe a little coaching support along the way. And we need to continually expand our capacity. Uh, for most of us, social emotional learning was not part of our undergraduate program. It is something that we are continually getting more comfortable with. Uh, but that does not mean we feel like experts. So use those resources, collaborate with each other, try something because it will benefit students. A few more resources that I just want to share. Um, we have a, an assessment suite that is completely free. And as I said, the needs assessment that I showed data from earlier is on that suite and you can use it with students. Um, there's also so performance-based observations and performance-based reflections that students can do that help you measure their growth in a specific competencies, such as self-regulation or assertiveness. And uh, many schools use these as part of their social emotional growth measures. We also have family resources that can support you to uh, really collaborate and engage with families. Uh, this is an area that all families are working on as well, and it is an area that um, COVID did impact. We all had to change our plans when um, adjusting to face-to-face, -to, -face, to virtual, to hybrid, to all sorts of things, and our self-regulation looked different in that. Um, one of the things that Shanna mentioned was getting enough sleep, having positive sleep habits. That can be adjusted through self-regulation instruction, actually helping students come up with a plan for getting enough sleep at night so that they can feel energized during the day. And each student's plan for that is likely to look somewhat different. And that is really where the ownership, the empowerment of students comes into play. And this builds the resilience because they understand that they are not passive recipients but they can be active participants within their life. And they have a lot of control over everything from their learning to their emotional reactions. So please contact me if you have any questions. Use the Q&A. Hey, look at that. My timing's perfect. <laughs> Use the Q&A to ask any questions you have. I encourage you to come up with your next steps for using those two strategies and for sharing the information with others. Uh, we also have um, online courses available this summer, and I will put that information in the chat. Back to you, Lori. Thank you so much, Amy. I, I enjoy doing those exercises. Uh, they actually help me think through things in my own life. And now I feel like I have something I can take to my students as well. So this has been a productive afternoon. This is great. Well, thank you again so much. Um, I'd like to introduce our third speaker for today. Um, this is Marta Silva. She is an immigrant educator from Spain. Uh, she teaches Spanish as a heritage language at Aletha North High School, where she is building leadership team co-chair and assessments coordinator, and where she sponsors the Latina Leadership Club. Marta participates in her district's equity team and is part of the Latino Affinity Group. She's a doctoral candidate at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where she is completing an interdisciplinary dissertation in the fields of curriculum and instruction and Latinx studies. Her passion for education has grown from her collaboration with her Latinx students in the creation and implementation of a pioneer heritage language program at the high school level. Her hope is to plant seeds in the educational system so that our multicultural 
uh, multilingual students are allowed to use their own tools to disrupt an intrinsically discriminatory institution. So Marta, thank you so much for being with us today and I am going to turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Laurie. So nice to be here with you. Um, and okay, uh, yes, okay. So um, good afternoon to all of you and I hope you're standing up and moving. Uh, it is not odd for me to talk to my own computer because I've been a remote teacher for this last year. And I've learned a lot of things like, uh, I'm not saying COVID was a good, things for good thing for teachers, but I've learned many things that I'm planning to take in next year to the in-person um, school that, that we'll be having. My, um, my uh, topic today is searching, documenting, and creating relevant connections. And this, this uh, presentation is based on my own learning in the, in the school last year, what's, what happened in, uh, in my school with my, with my students. So this uh, social uh, isolation uh, did not only happen during COVID, but um, we saw it more. We had proof that this happened more and, and we knew more depression and anxiety among our students and also among our colleagues. To me, the most important thing uh, with the social emotional learning is that this is not an add on. This is not a nice thing to do. It's, it's a must, it's, a, it's essential. And we can see it in research and we can see it in the results of our students. Um, this is a question that I want you to bear in mind through, through the whole presentation. And um, you know, how connected are you to your students and how connected are your students to you? Um, and also how much do you value those connections? Because tell you the truth, not every teacher, not every educators, educator values those connections as much. Um, not judging, just you know, stating. Um, so just to show proof of what I mean, this is an email that a student of mine sent to me back in November, 2020. We were together for like two months. And when I say together, I had never been together with my students. Um, they were remote, so my students were like, you guys are now just black boxes uh, most of the time. I did not request uh, for students to turn their, their cameras on for a variety of reasons. But this, uh, to me as a researcher, not only as a teacher, but as a, as a researcher, I found a lot of keywords here where I learned what students value in, uh, in good teaching. And I saw words like, you know, help, uh, flexibility, uh, that I do activities with them, the collaboration piece, uh, that I ask questions, that I'm excited. And believe me, I'm not every morning I'm excited to, to be there. But I, uh, you know, this is my job. I, I take it very seriously. So I, after my coffee, I'm pretending to be the most excited person in that classroom, even if it's if it is in front of a computer. And also they already know in November that I want everyone to succeed. So to me, this is valuable information. And this is very important for what we're gonna be talking today here. You know, I this is this is the categories that I took from this email. Um, this is what a student's value in us. And I do think that if we don't listen to these words, we're missing the point. If we just put our teaching hat and teach, 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 and give, give, give without receiving, um, it's a unidirectional um, kind of process. So today I'm just gonna ask you, ask you to reflect on three things. And this is a process that I've been using during this year. And I do think that I've created great connections with the students that if I if I met outside or if I met at a store, I don't think I would recognize. They would recognize me, but not I wouldn't recognize them. So first, ask questions, lots of questions. Then document your answers. Just don't ask questions for the sake of asking, but document answers. Then use that information. 
use it in the future, use it to create those moments. And I want to show you that Dave Stewart call of genuine connections. So be intentional in creating these relationships. Um, for asking questions in the remote world, we had so many different platforms. I mean, I used so many and I use them constantly, like every single day, not just one day you do a survey and that's it. Um, I started every Zoom with questions to my students and I love Zoom and I, <laughs> I do because they have that chat option with the direct message. So I learned so much about my students and my students could be private about their answers. Uh, my community, the community of Latino students, um, it's, a, it's a very private uh, community. There's a lot of trauma involved. So I'm very happy to hear from, from Shana at the beginning because there's a lot of trauma involved. And when they, they develop that trust with you, then you get to learn a lot of the uh, life experiences from, from them. Um, I ask questions, very easy to, to answer like this, put a star, annotate, put whatever, like however you're feeling in that line. And then they will explain to me in the Zoom why they're feeling that way. And the, the beginning is everything is very abstract, but it's, it, it becomes more, uh, more precise and more specific with, with time. Um, we are all researchers in my class. My students with me, we analyze. So we were changing from schedule to schedule. I'm asking, so how is that impacting your life? But, I, but I'm asking because I really want to know, because I really want to take that somewhere to administrators, to some place that so their voices are not just unheard. And I don't ask questions if I'm not using the, the information later. Um, so. We did a lot of uh, Flipgrid, and this was uh, also the, the, and I think it was Shana also who said the importance of keeping eye contact. But I noticed that making videos and me making videos, video responses, even short ones to my students make more sense than just me writing feedback to those same students. Um, we did a lot of journaling with uh, topics that they, they can be very, very general, but this some of my students got really deep into it. And this is the part that I really, um, that I changed this year, that I adjusted this year, and I wanted to share with you. I created a log. I recorded the information. Uh, my log was very like messy at the beginning, and it became a little bit more structured. Um, I created a log with just pieces of information my students were giving me every day in a variety of activities. Okay, so just uh, these are these are real. Uh, these are real students, and these are real things that that my students uh, told me that you know they get anxious that they're that a student told me that she she had a baby and I I had no idea with the the pri privacy issues we we were not uh, we were not uh, told in form of this and this is very important for me that's one of the reasons I don't ask for cameras on. Um, Somebody worked two jobs and they will zoom in from cleaning houses. And um, somebody told me that that got deported last year and they were living with their uncle. So all these little things that they, they would tell me in a variety of places, I will make sure I, I had a chart that I record those things because then I use them with them. We create conversations. That means I really care about you. I'm not just asking questions in, in abstract. I'm relating things to you. And in the morning in that Zoom and direct message or when they were working on something, I will maybe send them a message saying, hey, how are you feeling? Is your mom doing better? Or, hey, did you work yesterday till three, two? Or how was that? So those little things uh, become really big in building, in building relationships. So after that, um, I do like I look I do like tables, so I do categorize their their answers, and um, I do think there are two different areas that I ask questions. One, the personal life, just I say uh, that human connection. What's about work? For me, for my high school students, work and my Latino students' work is very important. The family, family issues. So I understand who they live with. Where is the family support? What does it look like? 
that's very important for me in order to, if I have to make a phone call, a, a home, uh, a phone to their home, I know what I'm, I'm going to expect. And also their health. There is a lot of mental health issues, and in the Latino community, they're unaddressed. A lot of issues that uh, a lot of our, our communities don't go to therapy. It's just a cultural thing. So there, there are other ways and other resources that I can provide my students in school, et cetera. And then on the other side, the academic life. You know, how is the school going for you? Do, you, do they have issues with certain teachers? Sometimes a teacher, you know, there's a name of one specific teacher that repeats over and over again, for good and bad reasons. And sometimes if they're good for good reasons, I will contact that teacher and say, hey, you know, my students are naming you and it looks like you're making an impact in this student in this student's life. So uh, just what is their future? What do they wanna do when, they, when, when they're adults? And I think this is very valuable information. Um, then um, I also, it's important that we keep this kind of visual to avoid blind spots. Uh, you know, you are teachers and you have uh, some students who are more uh, similar to you that you care for and uh, unconsciously you call on them more, you know about them more, you do more things with and for them. And we do have those biases and we have those blind spots of kids who if they're not calling attention, we just don't know anything about them. So I made an intentional effort to see which of those kids had no information, like I didn't know things about them. I hadn't, that I have not uh, developed that trust. Um, and this is, this second part is based on uh, Dave Stewart Jr. And I don't know if you know him, but I will recommend that you uh, access, he has some very short videos with very interesting ideas and he calls it moments of genuine connection and what he does he has just a clipboard a regular clipboard and he has all the names of his students and every time he makes what he calls these moments of genuine connections um he just he puts like a check mark so he and he makes sure that he has done this with every single student that he has not just talked to this student like so many times but this student he has not really addressed him or her and i have kind of um uh, the, the objective is in both of us is the same. I want students to feel known, valued, and respected. What I've done is I make sure that when I make this contact with student, I just don't say, oh, I care about you. Well, that's great. That's beautiful. But sometimes if I say, hey, how is your uncle doing? I think that goes farther because and if you say the name of the uncle, that's even goes farther because it creates that, that connection. Like she really knows me. She really cares about me. She is asking me questions that only my family, my friends do. So um, the integration of both, of both frameworks has worked really well in, during these remote, um, remote um, times. So also use, use at, you know, use that information to connect not only speaking, but there's so many ways that you can that you can do it. Um, for example, I do a lot of audio feedback. I've learned this year to do audio feedback. Of course, in the future, in person, we can do that also. But um, research uh, says that, you know, students, when they hear all of us, when we hear the nuances of the voice of our of a teacher of whomever, it makes a, a higher uh, impact in you than if you just read the words. So I've been using a variety of uh, apps in order to, if they write something, if they read something, in order for me to give some, some feedback. Um, so I do this, this voice, uh, voice mem memos. I also connect with their experiences when they write for me. Okay, when they write for me on journaling, my comments um, are part of my own experiences. So if this kid is telling me that he misses, he misses eating together, that, that's powerful information. He misses eating together with his, his family right now. Uh, his mom just works so much that they don't have time to eat together. So so I, in, in here, my comment is not like, oh, you put a V and it was a B. It is not that, or you don't have an introduction. My comment in their journaling 
is, you know, that happens to me too. You know, my kids have, have they do sports and I don't see them and I, I really try to, and what do you think we can do? So it's really a conversation. It's really that human connection that a lot of times we're, we're missing, um, we're missing in, in, in schools so i am so happy i, I this is this is a very long uh uh presentation that that i did for my district and i took a lot of things out um wishing i could i could do it in 20 minutes and i did it in less so i hope that you got some good information and that you can do it with your students next year um and value every every of those moments of genuine connections because as uh, Shauna and Amy have said, uh, if you have those connections, uh, their academics will anyway improve. It's not only about the human connection, but also their future will be a, a better future. So thank you so much for being here and for this platform. Marta, thank you so much for sharing all of those strategies with us. I think those are, are really exciting. They're things that I know I've done little bits and pieces of them, but I, I get excited thinking about putting all of those together and adding some of those things and building um, better relationships with my students so that not only do they know I really care about them um, and their education, but then that helping to get them to care even more about their education and themselves and see themselves as important. So thank you so much for that and for all those reminders. So everyone, um, I would like to open things up for questions now. So if you have not entered a question yet in the Q&A section, if you would do that, that would be lovely. Um, and all of our presenters, if you would like to come back up um, on, on video and um, audio, I do have a couple of questions that we've had people um, submit so far. Um, and I think these are ones that all three of you can um, speak to as well. So let me get started with the first one. Um, we had one question that asked, what are your thoughts about building on students' background experiences to promote safety in the classroom? I can start. Um, sure. Uh, always start with building on students' background knowledge and they are nobody is ever in isolation of their environment. Um, so whether their background of safety is coming from a healthy perspective, or maybe there have been some negative things that have impacted that, um, they're going to take it from their frame of reference regardless. So knowing and understanding what that frame of reference is, what that background and, and home life is like, what that pre-knowledge is, is super important to knowing um, not only what to teach, but how to teach it to each child. Yeah, just reiterating exactly what Shanna said um, is that anytime we can connect to their experiences and make them feel like we really know them and see them exactly what Marta was talking about, um, that is what promotes the safety in the classroom, both that emotional and physical safety. Um, understanding that if, if it's a child that uh, does not want their shoulder touched, you knowing that, understanding that um, by doing so, you can derail everything about the day. Um, but if you get to know that child, um, then you're able to have more meaningful connections. And, and lastly, I mean, I think this is especially important, but for our minoritized uh, communities, the ones who do not have the same standards in health and, and safety as the ones that you might, uh, you know, taking into account, I don't know if it's 80% of our teaching um, staff is, is white females, middle class white females. Uh, think about who your students are, where they come from, and what he what healthy and safe um, standards look like in their own culture. So it's very important to do some research before and not to make assumptions. Um, so that's that's it's key. That context, like uh, I think Cheryl was saying, context is key. 
Well, thank you. Um, another question that we had um, was, um, how often um, do you do mental contrasting um, about a certain goal? Do you do that just once or every day or at some other time? I think, Amy, this is probably geared toward um, your presentation. Um, yes. But I, I think probably um, the other two of you also can chime in on this because I, I think you do these check-ins and things with students as well and talk about that. So um, what do you all think? So I'll, I'll start with the direct answer. Once can make a huge difference. Uh, the studies, and I actually put it in the response uh, so that you can go and actually read one of the studies that was done. Um, they use three sessions, one day, a two day follow up. And uh, three weeks later, each session was one hour long teaching students this process. And that is what made that enormous difference. Um, students weren't told to do it daily. I think it is some, a practice that we could all use daily. Um, in our work, we have found that it is great to prompt students. So take really young students as they're coming back. What's going to make the best recess ever? Imagine a really good recess. Now, what are all the things that can get in the way of this being a really good recess? And what are you going to do if you encounter any of these barriers? So it's thinking in advance. If the swings are taken, what do I do? Um, because as we haven't had some of those experiences this past year, uh, the emotional reaction to that can be very strong. Uh, the same thing goes with a project's coming up or a test is coming up in middle or high school. You know, what, what does it look like to be successful on that? And then thinking backwards and what could get in your way of success and what can you do about that? And so um, one of the things we try to do all the time is uh, prompt it when it makes sense in a classroom uh, for whatever that might be. Uh, it can be a bell ringer. It can be uh, in the course activity. Uh, and if possible, if it is written down, when it comes to self-regulation, if you write it down, it's more likely to happen. Uh, so or draw it out, any sort of physical piece um, helps us uh, commit to that more fully. And Amy, I don't know about you, but I oh, I'm always so much better with I for the students that for myself. Like I do, <laughs> <laughs> I like with my students, I'm like very structured. And then if I try to do something, and I believe me, I do, I'm a mess. I don't. <laughs> Right, which is one of the reasons that we need to change from social emotional learning being like, we've got to fix something. We are all still working on this. We are working on self-regulation, conflict management. It needs to be normalized in a lifetime uh, endeavor that we continue to work on and grow at. And if we look at it that way, then it is something that we are all promoting at all times. So it sounds to be listening, um, listening to to both of you and and also Shannon to the things that you said that um, when you're talking about the the mental contrasting and the relationships that it's not a matter of we need to fix something, but that it is a matter that we need to continue on improving who we are. Um, so instead of a, approaching something with a I'm going to fix my students or I'm going to fix myself, hopefully, um, is more of I'm going to improve um, class for my students and my students' experiences and improve, um, improve myself and improve my life as well. Would you, well, would you all agree that that's kind of the way it, you're looking at this? Definitely. And we couldn't avoid COVID. That impacted all of us. And so the question is, how do we move forward from there without it being something that stops us? What are the things that we can learn from it? How do we take this and make ourselves and help our students become more resilient from it? Yeah, and I'll just chime in with a little plug. Uh, I'm getting no financial benefit from this, by the way. I don't even know if I can get it with my background, but it's Dr. Bruce Perry, um, and it's what happened to you. Is it working? 
Mm. Pull it back toward your chest. Where's my chest? That's okay. it. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> I learned something new today. Um, so what happened to you? And he wrote it actually with Oprah Winfrey. Really good book for anyone. And um, one of the things that I was thinking of when Amy was describing that, um, and not necessarily with contrasting, but it, for some reason it, it struck me, is he he gives a story in here about a situation with a little girl that had experienced some sexual trauma and nobody could get her really to testify or talk about it. And he didn't know her. And so the relationship wasn't there. So he described his strategy was to literally go into the home, talk to her for a few seconds, kind of watch her play he would play she'd kind of watch him he'd leave he'd actually go outside wait 10 minutes come back inside do it for a few more minutes go back outside and he continued to do that over and over and over again because his point was that it wasn't um the duration it's not how much time you have with the kiddo it's the intention behind it and it's the frequency so if you're seeing a child every day, you get that opportunity to see them. So even if you're a support staff person or you're a secretary, or you're a school bus driver, oh my goodness, you have a moment every single day to see every kid that's on your school bus route, make eye contact and say like, I am so happy you're here today. It's going to be a great day. And those after, over and over and over again, again, it's the frequency that makes the difference. It's not, it's not the duration. It's not the amount of time. Mm -hmm. And also, Lori, uh, you, if I may, um, I think we as teachers learn a lot about ourselves when we do these checks. Um, and we learn that sometimes we're looking through that deficit lens and we are looking for what's wrong. Like what you said, you know, we're trying to fix our kids. And I don't know where that is maybe part of, of our training as teachers, like we are there to fix what is wrong instead of use uh, the amazing potential that our students and talents, very different talents our students have that have nothing to do with our talents. And we don't even call those literacy or literacies. So I think it's a good place for us to stop and think uh, what am I looking? And I did, when I did this, um, when I was started by log, I noticed that a lot of the things that I was writing were negative things, things that there were red flags for me. Um, well, that's not everything that should go on a, on a log. You know, there are a lot of very positive things that I, I, the red flags are important to take it, to take into account, but so it just, it switches also you, our mind is more a collaboration with your students. We're all growing together and they have so much more to, to teach us. And we have to get away from that savior complex. Like I'm going to teach you, I'm going to tell you how to do this. I'm going to, because if we keep on doing that, and I think when we document things, it's very easy to see where we really stand and that's not that we're not our intentions are not fantastic but the impact might not be what we expected i i know that when when i teach i often find um these really incredible and wonderful things about my students. I mean, just amazing talents that they have. Um, and it's always exciting for me to learn about what these are and to get a chance to learn from my students. Um, I know I, I find they seem to find that um, really exciting when they can teach me something. So mm -hmm. when, when they become the teacher and I become the learner um, and I, I always enjoy that exchange with them. Um, I did want to share another question that we had that came up, um, and this one asks specifically, what can I do to respond to or to help a student who isn't getting enough sleep because she's sleeping on a couch in a home with 14 other people? Um, there's also illegal drug activities in this house. So I think, Shanna, this kind of goes to the example that you gave. Um, so do you all have any advice or suggestions about um, a situation that's specific like this? So I can start with that one um, for sure. So first of all, props to you for understanding what's going on in the home setting. I mean, that's kind of the first step, uh, the fact that, that you recognize that this child's not getting enough sleep and you recognize why. Um, those are important things. As far as illegal drug activity and whatnot, um, those would be legal issues, um, 
you know, mandated reporting issues, possibly depending on the severity. So that, I'm not going to speak to that end of it. But as far as the sleep piece, um, depending on the age of the child, education for the child or the parent may be helpful and um, resources may be helpful. You know, maybe there's not a pillow or somebody's willing to donate a bed if they're sleeping on the floor. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons um, why. The other piece is, I think Marta would say the same thing, the cultural piece. Um, you know, you have to look at, is this just normal and typical for this child? And maybe she really is, he or she really is sleeping okay because they co-sleep with people frequently or, you know, something that that would be typical for that. So again, it's coming from that perspective of everybody's experience um, translates into their own effect. And so if her experience isn't a negative one in that, um, then the effect is not negative for her. So, so making sure that is the problem from your viewpoint really truly a problem for the child um, and in their viewpoint? And then if it is, I think then that's where Amy's, you know, if then comes in and how can you help that child with that problem solving? Um, it may be that, you know, if I didn't get enough sleep last night, then I'm going to come to school and, and let my teacher know and she's going to give me 10 minutes to lay down in the safe space so I can get some rest before I start learning, you know be creative, think outside the box um, for things like this. That's exactly what I was gonna say on the be creative part. And uh, that it really becomes a coaching opportunity. Uh, it sounds like you can't solve this for the student. Uh, and so um, what it comes down to is helping the student having those conversations about if you're not getting enough sleep, where might you add some? Um, if it can't be in the evening, are there opportunities at school? Are there downtimes? Um, are there open spaces in the nurse's office for short periods of time? Um, is it, are you walking home after school every day? Could you stay uh, for an extra 45 minutes while there's still people there and it is a safe space in order to get a little bit more rest? Um, but again, very individual um, based uh, with a lot of input, probably from uh, the student, ideally, uh, as well as parents, if possible. Well, I want to thank all of you very much. I don't see any other questions there at the time. Um, you all have answered everything beautifully and, and given us so much to think about. And what I really love is that you've given us actual things that we can do, practical things that teachers can do. Um, and I, look, I'm i excited about going out and trying some of them. I hope those of you out there in the audience are as well. Um, so I do want to thank each of our uh, presenters very much for coming and for sharing with us today. Um, this has just been wonderful and the conversation has been great. And we so much appreciate your being part of this endeavor. Um, also, all of you who attended today, I want to thank you so much for coming and for being part of this, uh, for being part of us here in the audience. Um, you all have been just terrific and thank you for sending in your questions and comments. Um, also, just to let you know, there is a participant survey. Uh, so there is a link to that in the chat space and it would be super helpful to us if you could fill that out. And for any of you who might be interested in certification of completion of this conference session, something you might want to report to your school district, um, you can email us at global hyphen academy at ku.edu. Again, that's global, global hyphen academy at ku.edu. So again, thank you so much, Marta, Amy, and Shanna for joining us today. And all of you out there, thank you so much for joining with each of us. So for the School of Education and Human Sciences and the Kansas State Department of Education and also the Global Academy, we thank you all so much for being part of our presentation today. So we'll see you soon. We'll be back next week on Tuesday and Thursday with some additional conferences.